got a message on my YouTube saying there's something I should watch. So this is XKCD. We're going to go around the room and rumors, gossip, announcements, and you need to tell me something you listen to, like a podcast, watch, like a YouTube stream, other than everything, because we all know that you all watch that. Uh, or read, like the Risks Digest. Wow. And we all know what the product of digestion is, right? All right, so this is something I read. This is XKCD, and I really like to see it. And we're now streaming, so welcome, I tell you. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group October meeting. It must be the 26th, because Dave is notably efficient in such matters. Don, stop talking. I'm trying to have a meeting here. So this is 20 days to fourth day. And it's 10 days to regret all your life choices and 10 days to put your presentation together. Or if you can multitask, you've got 20 days to do both simultaneously. Except simultaneity is a null concept. It says here right in the, in the physics book. All right. Take me back to the XKCD. Why? Oh, because it was, I was reading. It was better than that. You drew my attention. And you have a, and you have a laptop over there, so you don't need my copy of XKCD. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, I feel like we should go around the room and, and talk about fourth day, but we're not going to. So instead, we're going to go around the room. By the way, I'd like to mention that there is there are fourth books available. So go to the agenda page. If you can't find the agenda page, try using your search engine and say, when is the next SVFIG meeting? And it'll find it. Or you could do what I did in the uh, agenda announcement and think of creative search terms for finding the SV Fig page. And did, did anybody do that? Because I didn't get any emails. And then what happened? You did? He sent me an email, and apparently I didn't read it or didn't get it. What? Oh, I see. So if you have creative search terms, you can tell me about them as, as I go around the room. But in the interim, I want to say there are books. And you can read about the books available and find the list. The, list, the link to the list is on the agenda page. There are t-shirts, much like the one I'm wearing now, but nicer. Uh, <laughs> And you can have your own. And there's a link there that can hopefully steer you in the direction of that. And so let's go around the room and talk about two things. One is if you have a, a creative search term that will get you here to the agenda page, I want to hear about it. And two, what do you uh, read or look at or listen to on the interwebs. And we're going to write down the links because it amuses me to do so. Yeah, so, right. George. Hang right. in, by the way, with the mic. Because from past videos, I've noticed that you can't hear the... Oh, that's actually way close enough. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> we're close enough. All right. I think we're close enough. All right. And it's Brad, you don't, you don't actually have oh. to track me around the room. Yeah. You can just focus on the... Our, our, we have faces for radio. So this, the first thing you want to do is say, who are you, so, George? Speaking of rumors and gossip, Ilhan, she-wolf of the SS squad. <laughs> All right, just look up she-wolf of the SS and then put in Ilhan, as, use your imagination. The, that, that won't get you to the SV thing yeah. <laughs> agenda page. 
Uh, Charles Barkley had stern words for our vice president. I think what I heard him saying was... Biden or the other one? I think I heard him say, I didn't put no bullet in the furnace and stop talking about my mother. What? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought I heard. And, ha <laughs> ha, science deniers. Have you been accused of being a science denier? Like we used to, warming denier. We, we used to say <laughs> pretending to be, and now we say identifying as. My, what my favorite all-time website is my friend shot mom. But today I will promote behindtheblack.com. Oh, I Be know people that are on that list. Yes, all right. Uh, so I'll, I will go to the board and start appending websites. If you talk real slow, I'll keep up with you all. All right. I'm Kevin Appert. I'm the program chairman. And my favorite that I want to talk about is risks.org. And they have the risks news group digest that you can read. R-I-S risks R-I-S-K-S dot org. And that's all you need to write down. And if you can't find it, I'm sorry Google is broken on your end. Uh, that should be enough. It'll take you there. I think the gods are punishing you for your impudence. <laughs> Try Catless. <laughs> You're up. We'll, we'll fiddle around with that later after I've gone once around the room and we'll bring up the risks news group. Uh, Don Golding, um, working on a new board. Uh, Brad's been a big help. Dr. Ting is also working on this board. He's, uh, Dr. Ting has made some really cool um, programs. Um, we're trying to build a, a new intelligent robot that's running forth and we're, we're having a maddening experience with this board. We're using the ESP, basically the solo board. Um, you know, you give it power, you give it a serial port, and you give it a reset uh, you know, resistor and cap, and it should just work. System on module. And the flash inside the module has given us a hard time. And we'll be hearing more about that <laughs> at 3 o'clock this yeah. afternoon, and that's Pacific, stupid time. Uh, your time may vary. Risk five. Oh, dumbass time. You gotta <laughs> Hi, Kevin. I'm Dave Jaffe. And yesterday, I went to an event called the Abilities Expo in San Mateo. Ooh, and cool. I saw an interesting product called the Omeo wheelchair, O-M-E-O. And it's a self two-wheel, self-balancing wheelchair that you operate just by shifting your weight. And, uh, and from New Zealand. That sounds so cool. I guess I couldn't operate it because I'm shiftless. My name is John Harbold. I'm still looking for work. I've been through interviews, both uh, telephonic, uh, internet, and face-to-face. -face. Somebody out there, please give me a job. Uh. Oh. So while you're looking for work, is there like a podcast that you read, or a comic strip on the interwebs, or well, a I, YouTube I, channel? Well, I read, or, uh, I read Zippy the Pinhead. OK. <laughs> I'm on board with that. Hey, I'm Strick. Uh, I guess my new sort of podcast thing is Coco Talk. It's, a, it's on YouTube, and you can find every week hours of information about all the latest in the fast-moving world of Radio Shack Color Computers. Coco Talk. C-O-C-O. T-A-L-K. Coco Talk. Is it all one word, or is yeah. there a hyphen? Oh, that's one word. Oh. There's no M dash nor N dash. Talk, like T, Tango, Abel, Lima, King. You know you can tell how old someone is by which phonetic alphabet version they use? Abel, Baker, Charlie, Fox, uh -huh. Dog, <laughs> um, Easy. Yes. I'm Dennis Roofer. Dennis I'm, is our former stream master. I'm retiring. 
<laughs> oh. You're still doing the audio check because I can't even manage to remember to bring headphones every time. <laughs> oh, I've got, I've got a pair I can lend you. <laughs> Occasionally I do something useful. These days I'm working on um, AI in IoT at the edge. It's all around. Trailer. It's all around. It's everywhere. Um, and working on this thing, the, the website that I'm looking at is Seed Studio, S-E-E-E-D, Studio. Three E's, Seed yeah. Studio. Yeah, they provide a lot of hats. Yes, and cards. they have this thingy, which is a makes Duino. M-A-I-X Duino kit for RISC V AI plus IoT. If uh, right now doing face detection. Would you like to uh, talk about that in December? If I have something working. Sure. Yes. Deal. Right now, uses it is here. So is there like a podcast that you read or? Oh, wait. Oh, you know what I like it's, to read is Dennis Roofer's Facebook posts. Because pretty much every 20 minutes, Dennis posts some damn thing to Facebook. Yes. And it's almost always of interest. So, friend, friend Dennis, is there anything that you'd like to pass along? All right, Koss is, uh, is what Dennis reads. But I did do... I have gotten it to do that I'm doing a um, training of a neural network. It just took um, some 20 hours to do it. So it's been going a while, and it's now sitting here for me to do the next steps, which have been crashing. <laughs> so it's recognized a finger. So you're up. <laughs> Say your name. Hi, this is John. And what are we talking about? You're going to tell me what podcast or YouTube stream or uh, web news group or thing that you read or watch or listen to. I listen to the Retro Hour podcast, the Scene podcast, which are all retro in nature, as well as the Amp Hour, primarily electronics, and a whole bunch of other security podcasts all at the same time. Cool. Thank you. Which I can provide a long list of links. Hot surprise. It came out right. of nowhere. I'm Sean. I do CV for the first tech challenge. And speaking of two-wheeled wheelchairs, I believe our founder, Dean Kamen, was the first person to make one of those. Awesome. That, that trumps everything else. If you search for his name, there's a picture of him on one. You're not allowed to use the word Trump. <laughs> I am just pulling your chain. I read the script Mega Tokyo. It can be NSFW depending on the people around you. And they actually made a cameo on um, number 60 of XKC. Cool. Oglaf. O G L A F. Was it Mega Tokyo? Mega Tokyo. Mega. Mega Tokyo is about to explode. No, 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 no. Separate line. Two different things. Yes, they are two different things. These <laughs> are two different things. <laughs> no, Mega Tokyo is different from Oglaf. Oh, oh, all right. Well, that's different. You put in parentheses NSFW next to Oglaf because almost always is. Pretty reliable. There are few things you can rely on in this world, but one is that Oglaf is going to be once a week and not suitable for work. Okay, I'm Ch Ting, and what I'm following uh, lately is uh, a website on YouTube. Uh, I think it's called a True V O T, T R U E V O T. V O T. Yeah. V -O -T. True vote. Yeah, true V O T. Yeah. And th this is an uh, interesting, uh, interesting site, and they are trying to investigate uh, the current president of Taiwan, uh, Mr. Ts uh, Ms. Tsai. And she's supposed to get a PhD from the London 
uh, School of Economics and Political Science in 1984. And uh, her PhD uh, <coughs> degree c came into question a number of years ago, but currently they are, they are just, uh, uh, this website is just try to uh, get to the bottom of it. And it claimed that she didn't have uh, a, PhD, a PhD degree there. And she didn't submit her uh, thesis. thesis. And so, so this guy uh, went all the way from Taipei to London. And uh, I went to the libraries in the uh, London School of Economics. And he couldn't find a copy of it. And he, was, he asked about li librarian, is it possible that this, uh, this thesis uh, uh, was missing or getting lost or something? But librarian ens uh, ensured him that uh, if there is such a copy of thesis, it has to be there, it can be, cannot be lost, but it's just not there. Amazing. Yeah. All right then. So the election, the presidential election will be uh, January 11th of 2020. So Ooh. the election is coming up. With a scandal. Yeah, it's a big scandal. So I, <laughs> and not only that, she was dressed in blackface. <laughs> Right. The same year she's expecting uh, Hillary to be elected the president, but she got elected a woman as the first woman president in Taiwan, and she was hoping that uh, the United States would elect a woman president at the same time. Uh, Johnny K. Blake. All right, I typed in risks dot and it filled in dot org. And then it said not secure catalyst.ncl.ac.uk.risks. But if you search for risks.org, this is what you'll get. And let's see, it's 1.32, so we still have a few minutes before Brad will come to the front of the room and talk about stuff. And Brad, are you, are you uh, prepared in, in some way? All right, converge on it, and we'll blather some more, and hopefully, uh, so, there was a, a relatively recent story on risks about a popular package that a lot of people, including some medical device manufacturers, put into their firmware. Decade-old code is putting millions of critical devices at risk. And this, this was a different story. This one was in Wired. But apparently, this hospital uses infusion pumps. And they previously found a, a problem in VxWorks. And they put out the word and this tester found the same problem in these infusion pumps and it turns out these infusion pumps don't run VxWorks. So to make a long story short, it's a, it's a little fable and it illustrates the problem of using heritage code. So there was this uh, network protocol that made the rounds uh, quite a while ago and people just used it and used it and used it for two decades. So what's the I guess you'd have to read the, it's, there's this suite of bugs that they talk about in the article. And it's, it's beyond the scope of this discussion, John. You mentioned that it said that VxWorks could not run this diffusion pump. 
BX Works was not running on this infusion pump. Oh, it was pump. not running on it. Okay. An infusion pump is something that pumps stuff into your veins. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. Uh, they're fairly common in modern hospitals. And this one had a computer in it and firmware. And as it turns out, didn't wasn't implemented with VX Works, but it Whoa. still had this bug because they have this network protocol suite in common. Okay, that's the other thing. If you know, uh, because I know VX Works uh, is uh, uh, compliant with uh, F F FDA, FAA uh, regs, so you can use it in hospitals and in aircraft. And they're saying, day. and they're going, oh. Maybe we can write our own loop. I said, you do that, and now your company becomes responsible. Then it's your problem. Yes. So, so Sean, just going, are you sufficiently plugged into risks around? now? You, you, you got a pathway to it in your mind? I feel like we've accomplished something. Tell me how you spell your name. S-H-A-W-N. Seems plausible. Let's go with it. All right. I would like to pass... The, you know, in the olden days, you used to have the talking stick. Now you have the HDMI cable and the microphone. So it's more of a concept. It's the talking stick. How do you spell it? S-C-H-T-I-C-K? So you have the my stick, and now you're going to be inflicted Uh, I'm Brad Before Nelson. Before he starts his talk. And, and if you're looking for, for interesting reads, I, I recommend uh, uh, Eli Benderski's the, the Green Place. Uh, it's uh, always, always uh, good and interesting uh, low-level technical topics. Um, all right. Um, so um, the intention with this, uh, this talk was to uh, uh, disseminate a little more knowledge to, to this group about usage of of, of Git and, and GitHub uh, because we've started to have a, a few things where uh, we're collaborating over time and distance. Uh, Don, Don and I and Dr. Ting are, uh, you know, iterating on these boards, and uh, I thought it might be useful to uh, uh, sort of give a little little mini introduction to uh, to Git because I think it would be helpful to for uh, collaboration. We, uh, so with that. Um, uh, Thought I also, of course, I also got sucked into the sort of comprehensive. Let me tell you, tell you the tale of source control. And, um, so motivation, right? We're uh, we want to keep track of all the changes and be able to go back and forth in different versions, compare versions, uh, but most importantly, work together in groups. Um, a, a colleague of mine uh, once uh, described the, the the problem that source control solves as uh, as the other fucker problem. Um, basically, you're working with this guy, and, and you know he's checking things in, you're checking things in, and you're trying to, to cope with uh, change coming from multiple places. And so that's that's kind of what it's uh, what it's for. Um, the, I went looking, um, as I have occasionally in the past, to, to see what if there were any sort of historical uh, fourth practices in this this space. Uh, uh, the only thing I could find, and I'd be curious if if anyone. Uh, who's actually used Forth in a commercial setting uh, has encountered anything else. Polyforth has this affordance for, for, for uh, doing what's called an audit, where you uh, have you know, version A and version B of your, your program, and uh, uh, you do some uh, comparison where you go block by block and uh, uh, look at the diff. Um, and there's a, a set of words to, to let you say, here's the range of blocks I want to compare, possibly on different partitions. Um, and then you, you sort of uh, see a display something like this where it highlights, so here are the things that got added or changed, and, and, uh, and then you, you say, oh, I want to keep this change, or I want to toss it, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, it, if anyone has encountered anything, uh, I'd be curious to hear if you, oh, Dennis. Have you done this a few times? Yeah. Including the audit utility. Including the audit utility, yes. The audit, audit utility is a ra rather nice thing. But that doesn't work. Oh, well, don't walk away. <laughs> you take my shirt with you. Um, the, for things like blocks, the audit utility is essential. 
what I've learned over the years, despite everybody else that says that blocks are wonderful, is I go into text and then use any editing matching utility you want, including the ones that are inside the Git itself. Git will do matching for merging. Um, it, in, and things like Git Kraken is a good one. Um, there's a few GUI I Git utilities that work excellent on text. But get out of these blocks. Even with Colorforth, I made a utility that puts it into text. So I can do exactly this. <laughs> so what you're telling us is <laughs> don't, 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 do don't, don't do it. Yeah, okay. Don't do and as I, I mean, uh, 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 you know, and it's interesting that the, the, this is the sort of the level of sophistication that, that I'd found historically. So anyways, with that, and I'm not sure what, to what time period this actually dates. That's why I, I, I've got a history of, what's that, 80s? 80s. Interesting. Well, that, okay. So with that aside, let's, let's dive into sort of conventional source control outside of the, the fourth domain and talk about that. So here, here's sort of a timeline of, 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 of source control. Uh, sort of er, the earliest, uh, er, earliest sort of thing, sort of rumblings in 1972, uh, all the way up through uh, uh, sort of Git Mercurial and the relative present. Uh, there have been revisions as we'll talk about since, but let me give sort of a, a, a brief synopsis to see how we got here. That's such a great thought, Brad. That's my handwriting on the thing. Second, no, uh, yeah. What's the one second from the bottom? Second to darks. Days. Yeah, it's a very obscure one. You, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I've heard you've heard of it. Yeah. Bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, well, we'll, we'll, I'm going to run through a little history just to just to set context and uh, just for fun because it was more fun to talk about history than too much. And we'll dive into a tutorial in a moment. But so the the earliest one that was out there. This is predates my actual practical. This is also a review of all the th all the systems I've used over the years. This was one I have not I have not personally used. Uh, oh my God, really? <laughs> Aha. Oh, oh wow! So, so I, I gather, I gather there were sort of two phases to this. The first one was Snowball, which was this, you know, early uh, string language. Uh, that, of course, somebody got got clever ideas about doing the kinds of string manipulation you would need to do diffs and whatnot to construct a source control system. Although apparently, then later folks uh, uh, re re reconstructed it in C for speed. Um, but in your uh, oh, here we go. what? Uh, I'll just lean in. I'll just stand here. Yes. Don't we still see SCCS IDs in code with its parens and ats and stuff? Uh, very possibly. I think some of that, some of the the, the history of That's it, sort of sticks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, because you can tag tag versions and, and whatnot in the uh, and uh, and apparently Bitkeeper uses it internally as as does Teamware, which I have no no context on at all. Um, and uh, so that was sort of the first data point. Uh, RCS, which I actually have used in practice, uh, yeah, came. <laughs> this is going to be the sort of like greatest hits history. So um, weird, weirdly, the the uh, uh, so let's see. So RCS, uh, you know, has a, a history per file, so it's it's not atomic commits and all of that. Uh, files are checked. You know, the, the cool thing is, well, the cool, not so cool thing is, files are checked in and out. Um, my my practical experience in this space was that uh, I was uh, working as an undergrad with a bunch of, of grad students, and of course I would be the guy that would check the thing out and then disappear off to whatever, and they'd be <laughs> needing to you know use root to go and check my shit back in. So <laughs> um, it does have support for branches and merging, but but it's it's no fun, um, and we'll see it comes up later with uh, with a, uh, uh, with CVS as a sort of a bit of internal plumbing. Uh, it works something like this, where you check in an individual file, you, ch you check it out, uh, which checks it out read-only, and then you can check it out with a lock and be the guy to edit the thing, and then, uh, and then check, check your changes back in. It, it, it does the thing it's intended to do. Um, it has a, uh, uh, a notion of branches and, and numbering that uh, is inherited by CVS, where you, uh, you, you sort of have your, your uh, branch number, and then you count revisions within that, so one, two, three. You can explicitly call out, okay, now I want to say I'm on version two. 
um, but you have the ability to make a branch based off of uh, those. And then what happens is that you add more numbers. So it all forms a strict tree. Um, this is OK if you kind of have the notion of I'm going to be off on a feature branch and do a thing. Um, but you know, yeah. Uh, um, lots, of, lots of areas in which it's not super intelligent about knowing uh, sort of uh, the, the places to do merges. Um, then in 1974, along comes diff. This is rewinding back slightly in front of RCS, uh, so I could put it next to patch. So th this becomes kind of a, an important piece. This accomplishes something similar to audit, but with varying degrees of sophistication. Um, being able to look at the diff between two, two files, kind of an essential piece in all of this. Um, and and uh, there's a variety of formats uh, that can be used for these diffs. But for source control, a kind of a key event is, is uh, Larry Wall, uh, who is also known for giving us Perl, uh, comes up with the idea of let's invert what patch does, and, and or sorry, invert what diff does, and uh, be able to take a diff and apply that diff. Um, and uh, then we get patches, and this, for a number of projects, uh, was sort of their vehicle for sending around code, and in, and in fact is still used in certain quarters. Um, and uh, sort of the, one of the more important attributes is this notion of uh, being able to apply a diff when something uh, uh, does, doesn't completely match the version at which it was applied, which is one of the motivations for having these various uh, diffing formats, is that if you give a little more context, you be a little bit more forgiving in terms of applying a patch to a version at which it was not originally the diff for. Um, Yes, uh, also, this, this, this was a big step up, because then I don't have to check in and out the, the files. Uh, basically, on top of RCS, a clever soul uh, got the notion of uh, allowing you to make concurrent edits and then, uh, and then uh, uh, using application of those patches to be able to apply them in time. Um, this, is, this is sort of the first step towards this actually being fun to collaborate with folks, because you could have two two individuals working both with a checkout at, at some version. They make changes. And when they go to commit, that's when they actually have to cope with getting in sync with uh, the status of the world. Um, one caveat is, of course, it was built originally as a bunch of scripts wrapping around RCS. So because RCS works per file, it, things are not atomic. So you, if you work on two, file, uh, two different files within the same uh, repository, you end up uh, potentially uh, being in weird states where if you can have uh, you can have the, your commit land at the same moment as somebody else, and the, and the changes to the individual files are interleaved. Um, also, this is dre dreadful when you want to move files around. You have a terrible, terrible time. In fact, uh, a common common thing that you would see was people actually moving the under, going in and poking around with the underlying RCS files to to move stuff so they'd get cleaner history. All kinds of goofiness you'd, you'd see with CVS. Um, but, but the other thing about this is that folks would use it, uh, as I frequently encountered it, on uh, putting the, uh, the, the, the files on a file share and, and, uh, and uh, you know, this sort of made for reasonable distributed collaboration. Similar kind of a model to, to RCS, but notice here where you can just check a thing out, go in, make some edits, add them, commit them, and just, you know, go to town. You periodically sync and, and all of that. Uh, along comes Clearcase in 92. Uh, the, big, the big interesting one that I feel like in, in general sort of for commonly used systems is not uh, uh, sort of a widely, uh, 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 is not a feature that has been widely imitated is integrating it with the file system and to, to a degree integrating it with the build system. You can do a bunch of cool things if you can see, you know, here are the files that got touched during the build or, uh, in terms of understanding what went into something. Um, so some of the ideas here, but this one works still on individual files. There's some uh, modern clear case. There's all kinds of hacks they've done to try to make it atomic commits and whatnot. But um, jump to 95. We're still sort of in the same world. Per, uh, Perforce comes along. It's proprietary. Um, it does have some some positive scaling attributes and a bunch of external APIs, which is why Google and Microsoft at some point started uh, they they started their lives using using these kinds of tools. 
uh, because they could, they could scale up. Uh, both of them, interestingly, eventually Microsoft apparently got a source license back in the day and uh, then decided to fork it and do, do their own thing with it. And uh, uh, that, uh, that was not a, uh, uh, so then they were using sort of a deviant version of Perforce. Google eventually produced their own sort of clone of the thing. and. Uh, and uh, uh, again, for scaling, once upon a time at Google, they, were, they had a single ginormous server that was the one Perforce server that uh, all the things were on and had to stay up and all that good fun. Um, the, uh, the big thing... <laughs> um, Perforce does, does bring in atomic commits, and uh, the, the, the nice thing is monotonically increasing sales, which you can... Both, both good and double-edged sword, uh, uh, monotonically increasing C, uh, CL numbers. You can uh, you can do all kinds of things in your release process to make assumptions about. Uh, I've got numbers going up and all of this, um, but it's also centralized repository. It does have some notion of an awareness of uh, what others are doing at the same time. One benefit of centralization. Um, in 2000, um, so actually. Why did we jump to, did I, we're missing, oh yeah, oh that's right, 2000. So, so 2000 subversion comes along, um, subversion was, was sort of p posited as a better CVS. The biggest thing it was trying to fix was introducing atomic commits. You, when you make a bunch of changes all at once, that's a single commit and goes in. It has a monotonically increasing revision number similar to Perforce. Um, and uh, it also has a network protocol so that you can have an explicitly set up subversion server um, and don't have to mess around with file shares and, and this kind of stuff to, to be able to collaborate with folks. Um, the, uh, there, it does have some underlying interesting scaling problems, but that's a topic for another day. Similar kind of cool workflow. You check out a thing, you do an update, you add files, you do a commit, all of that. And then along comes BitKeeper in 2000, um, and this, this was sort of the first major distributed version control system. And distributed version control is sort of this cool big idea that is, oh, that, uh, uh, that I think has made uh, a big change. And this is the same, this, uh, this notion of distributed version control is sort of the key magic feature of Git as well as we'll get to. Um, but it's a proprietary program. Um, but the cool thing is what, what distributed version control means is you end up uh, keeping a local copy of the entire repository on your system. And so if you're interacting with all of the history of uh, the project, you can do that extremely quickly because it's all in the local system. Everybody who's collaborating has that full history. Um, and then not only can you commit you know, concurrently in the same way that you could back to CVS, but you can actually uh, do this locally before you've even pushed any of that to the clouds. So you're able to do all kinds of things very efficiently. Uh, and this particular having the whole history uh, helps tremendously in terms of making merges less painful. Um, and so you, you end up having a world in which you're, you're able to sort of, uh, where previously uh, branching and merging was, was a thing to be avoided at all costs, uh, it starts to become a tractable thing. Um, and then, to much controversy, uh, Linus Torvalds decided to, uh, to use this product uh, despite it being proprietary for maintenance of the Linux kernel, um, which uh, in terms of uh, sort of the open source uh, goals of, of Linux was, was challenging, uh, but the makers of BitKeeper agreed to allow Linux kernel developers to, to use it for this as long as they did a variety of things, including agreed not to work on a, a source control system for some number of years afterwards, this kind of thing. Um, so this went sideways when um, a, a fellow decided he would, it was you know, unpleasant to have to use these proprietary tools and so decided to reverse engineer the client and uh, promptly put this up online, at which point the makers of BitKeeper said, oh, no, no, you're done, <laughs> and, and kicked everyone out, uh, leaving the Linux kernel in a, in a bit of a lurch. So in reaction to this, well, so Dark's not exactly a reaction, sorry. We'll, we'll get back to that story in a moment. Um, 2003, Darks sort of, there is a role here, but, but not really. So Darks is often a, sort of a, a different branch of <laughs> an approach to things. Uh, Darks um, <clears throat> is an attempt to uh, have a, a sort of a, a, a more mathematical approach to, uh, to patching logic. And so there's this algebra of patches uh, in which you have the notion that you apply a bunch of patches and they, they don't naturally commute, but there's a sort of a, a, a sort of a, uh, a way to, to reason about how you would make them commutative so that you could reorder them. Between that and inverting of the patches, uh, you can try to come up with a history of your project where the patches uh, are 
sort of uh, where, where, where it is a composition of patches. Um, this is good in the sense that you can, uh, you can do a bunch of interesting things in terms of understanding your, the, the evolution of your, sorry, the evolution of your, uh, your project as a series of patches. The problem is that unfortunately in some cases doing a merge can be ex exponential time. And these are kind of pathological cases that you can actually hit in practice now and again. So as near as I understand it, although there have been some attempts to address some of those limitations, there's still an outstanding problem in this space. There are some folks at SwearBot, Sam Falvel has used this for a few projects that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not sure what his current opinion is. I think the last time I, I asked him about darks, he made a funny face. So um, I gather, yeah. Anyways, picking up the, the story uh, with BitKeeper, um, Linus Torvald's uh, reaction, of course, is to go off and, and, and hide and, and uh, make his own source control, mimicking many of the features, including distributed version control, uh, that, were, that he liked from BitKeeper, uh, but sort of one-upping things in terms of simplicity and, and, and whatnot. Um, he, so he came back with this tool he called Git, uh, uh, possibly a reference to the, the BitKeeper folks, possibly a reference to himself, unsure which. Um, the, uh, it, it, of course, has uh, the same kinds of fast local operations and whatnot. Uh, the core of it is a whole bunch of uh, individual programs in C and then uh, a bunch of wrappers in, in various scripting languages. There's a graphical UX that comes in the standard package that even uses some tickle, frighteningly. Um, the, uh, and then just to finish out the history here, we'll, we'll mention Mercurial which uh, literally at the same time, and this was also kicked off by BitKeeper, uh, does a similar kind of distributed version control. This one was brought up in Python uh, originally, and then gradually they've moved more of it to C because one of the complaints with it is that it sort of falls over with large repos. Um, apparently Facebook has sort of doubled down on, on this one. Uh, I don't know the intimate details. At Google there are some, uh, there are some wrappers to, to, use, uh, to use this uh, uh, sort of wrapped around Perforce. Um, the primary motive for using Mercurial versus Git is, is, is it has a bunch of uh, stable APIs and uh, uh, binary stability in various ways that make this more tenable, but it's not deeply used at, at, at Google. Um, so that brings us to the present. Um, so what, why Git? Well, there's a number of things. One is it's immensely popular. The other, as we'll come to in, in, in a moment, uh, is uh, the success of a, of a, uh, a website called GitHub, uh, which makes it, uh, it, which sort of solves the problem for you of where to put your, uh, your shared server. But let's talk about how Git works. Did you talk about the repository? Yes. So let's, let's, uh, let's dig into the, the internals a little bit, a little bit uh, to explain uh, how things work here. So uh, let's talk about cryptographic hashing because that's sort of one of the big ideas that makes this possible. So cryptographic hashing um, is the idea that uh, uh, you can have a, a hash function that takes in a, a bunch of input and then comes out with bits that are supposed to be pretty uniformly distributed and random. So if you change one bit in the input, you should see massive changes in the output. Not a little bit similar to a CRC, but a CRC is sort of biased so that you, uh, you detect individual bit errors, uh, more, more appropriate for if you're going over a line. Um, the cool thing about this, though, is that it allows, uh, it solves the problem of coming up with a globally unique ID for a blob of stuff. And so you can have an arbitrary bag of bytes and come up with an ID that is not, you know, obviously it's, it's going to be a finite number of bits versus however, an arbitrarily large input. Um, but assuming uh, that this function really does give you something very random, um, you basically, uh, with a high probability, get a unique ID for each blob. Uh, so this is cool because it gives you a way to have a, 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 a distributed uh, po uh, pointer to an arbitrary blob of stuff. Uh, where you can collaborate on what the identifier for that blob of stuff is without having to actually communicate with each other. So there are all kinds of other strategies for having you know, global, global IDs, but you have to have servers and whatnot. So that, that key idea of I have a bag of bytes, I hash it, I get this ID, and now I can use that ID as a key to go back and find that if I've got an object store is, is crucial. Um, it's, the cryptographic hashing is also, of course, used for signing. You 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 hash the the, the big thing and then do a sign do do all your signature algorithms on just the di the digest that comes out. So you don't have to do uh, signing of all of the bits and and 
uh, it's also uh, proof of work algorithms use cryptographic hashing. You basically set up challenges where you say, I hear, you know, come up with the next ID in a certain sequence where the hash ends in so many zeros, this kind of thing. And you can use this as a way to demonstrate that you, you know, the only way you could have uh, uh, found these things is by going through each of the hashes until you found the one that ended with some number of, of zeros, that kind of thing. Um, uh, for Git, the particular uh, uh, algorithm that's used is one called SHA-1. Uh, in, it has a 160-bit uh, a uh, output, so you take an arbitrarily large bag of bytes, hash it, and then you get, uh, you get your 160 bits. Um, it's a 40-hex-digit 40, 40 uh, digest. Uh, you present these as hex digits, and typically in Git, you'll see these presented as hex, uh, uh, the, as hex digits, and that's what's used for all the IDs, IDs throughout. Um, intriguingly, it has actually, uh, it is no longer considered cryptographically sound in the cryptographic sense. Um, this is, uh, there have been attacks plausible for a while. Apparently, I, I just learned this in researching this presentation. I, I didn't realize that folks had actually uh, uh, found a collision and they've actually got two PDFs that have the same hash. Exactly. Because I worked at a place that did check printing. In particular, I believe with SHA, so it, it, more bits is always generally good. Although with SHA one, I believe there's some particular quirks of the algorithm that are that are yes. deficient as well. Um, so it's it's worse than just the even the 160 bits. Um, although I, I believe we're even was it SHA two or whatever, we're getting close to that one being. Uh, dubious, and there, there's a, there's a number. Of, we're we're several generations past this one, but intriguingly, Git has stayed with with SHA one, and uh, Linus Torvalds has actually been kind of uh, fairly adamant that this is not a problem. Um, the the rationale being that uh, all that the intention with this was never to uh, pick one of these hashes to uh, to actually make it a a cryptographically sound record uh, of the history of your project, but rather just to solve this problem of uh, having a unique ID, and so while it is possible with you know you know uh, mind-boggling amounts of computing to go intentionally find a collision, the probability of, of accidentally finding uh, a collision is is so small as to be something you can disregard. And so his argument is that if you're relying upon the uh, the uh, the SHA ones in, in Git uh, for the security of your repository, you have a problem. Um, so, but that's that's where we're at. Uh, there's and, and obviously there would be huge compatibility issues with switching over to a different uh, uh, hash function, um, and not to mention then you'd pro then you'd have to deal with an even longer digest. Um, so, how Git uses uh, these these uh, cryptographic hashes um, is that, uh, and hopefully this is somewhat visible from back there. Um, is that you have a bunch of uh, objects, and there's three main object types in, in Git. There's a uh, there's commits, there's trees, and there's blobs. And uh, the idea is that your repository history is a series of commit objects. The commit objects describe uh, the commit message, and um, the and they have uh, links to the parent. So you have the uh, you know a given commit has a link to its parent or parents if if there was a merge. Um, and then it has a link to, uh, to the tree that's the root of, of that particular commit. And then the tree, in turn, can have links to other trees uh, and, and or blobs for individual files. So you can think of these as sort of directories and individual files. And um, when you have a, a, a new commit, imagine the, the, the sequence here where um, in the original, say in the original commit, we had a tree and we had one text file with a particular hash uh, that was added. In the next commit, you might do something like add an additional file. And so now, because this, file, this blob has not changed, in this new tree, you link to that old, uh, that old ha uh, hash. And similarly, you can imagine if you had a gigantic repository, um, if there were subdirectories in here, 
uh, if a whole subtree had not changed, you could continue to link to the old uh, ob to the old tree object. And so the idea is that you're minimizing the degree to which uh, you need to uh, store new objects every time you have a commit. So you have the illusion that you're storing an entire copy of the the uh, the uh, the source tree for each one, but you're sort of hard linking to each of these. But then, like for example, if this uh, if this old text file changes in this commit, you reuse this blob, but you keep you introduce a new blob. In addition to all of this, under the covers, in a in a, uh, a form where you don't have to worry about it, uh, Git makes some attempt to pack together uh, all of these objects, and there's so. By default, they're stored just sort of flat in a, in a directory structure down in, uh, uh, down in your local checkout um, where, where they store individual files. But over time, it will try to compact them uh, into pack files where it's storing these as diffs. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of tricks for that. It is also the case because, if, as you notice, this is a, a graph structure. Um, if you do, do various operations, it is possible to do various operations where you uh, mutate this structure. And so there is a notion of being able to go and garbage collect and, and get rid of things if you uh, modified your history, which is another one of these things where modifying your history is, uh, um, yeah, possible. Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, when you're talking about an individual commit, the hash of, of one of these commit objects is, is what's used as the revision. And you can shorten it um, because, uh, and frequently you'll, you'll notice that 40-character uh, uh, hashes are not used uh, pervasively in, in UX because given that you only have a subset of the possible keys, people will, will frequently um, just take the first so many characters and assume that if there are no duplicates. And so you'll see people use the entire 40 character hash or you'll see them shorten it uh, in certain contexts. So hopefully that made some sense. So just looking quickly at it here, um, this is what a git commit literally looks like. Um, there's, it has a reference to the tree that is the, is that com the structure of that commit, the parent, so what the previous commit was, and then uh, information about who made the commit and the commit message describing what happened in that commit. Um, and then a tree object is just a, it's a directory, right? So it's got the file permissions for the, the object, it's got uh, the, the hash, the, the, sorry, the type of the object, and you'll note that the, 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 this object store uh, stores the data uh, map to that hash, but it doesn't store any of the metadata. So it doesn't know, a particular object is not, it doesn't uh, necessarily know that it's a blob. Um, the, um, uh, and then you, and then you have the, the path uh, to it. And so these blobs are individual files. The trees are subdirectories. Um, intriguingly, commits get reused. There's a feature we, uh, we'll, we can talk about later. It is possible to uh, reference a, a submodule, another repository that you've bound in, and those show up actually as commit commits here. And so you can uh, pull, you can fuse together uh, multiple Git repositories. And then a blob is just a, a lump of data. So. Um, what this does that's great is that now you can treat your, your version history as uh, this uh, collection of commits, and they can have a relationship. You can be busily committing, and then someone can go and uh, take this commit and go off and do some work with it, and then let you later merge it back in. And you, somebody else did a commit here, and you can merge it back in. And so you have the, the ability to kind of uh, intentionally go off and take a development in one direction, take it in another, and merge them together when appropriate. And to a large extent, what's, what's magical about Git is that it frequently does a very good job of uh, successfully merging work that is, uh, that is uh, that as long as that work does not overlap. Um, <clears throat> and an important, important thing to note is that the, this property of the, the, the hashes being uh, globally unique is very handy because you could have two different individuals who go and uh, d and uh, interact with some of these objects, and they'll even if they independently do some of these operations, they they uh, they converge back together again because the the same bag of bytes has the same hash regardless of who does that. Uh, whereas in in the, the the reason this is impractical in a number of centralized repositories is that you'd you'd need some way to sort of coordinate on the the hashes. Um, it's also, so the, so the normal strategy, by the way, for usage of Git, so there's two strat broad strategies for usage of Git. You can do a bunch of commits, uh, branch off for a feature branch to implement something and then merge it back in, um, or, you, or, or um, you, can, um, uh, you can also branch for the purpose of a, of a release and then allow 
cherry picking of fixes. You can use all sorts of interesting patterns. Um, one problem, though, is this captures all of the changes. And so as you mutate your project, you, uh, you can end up, uh, it, it, this can be both good and bad. You sort of, you know, every little, you know, if, if, you're, if you're, as I am, kind of tend to uh, want to make individual commits for tiny little changes, you've captured every little micro edit that you made locally. So a thing that uh, folks will frequently do, especially when they're collaborating, is a, a thing called rebasing, where you take all of this history and you collapse a portion of it down uh, so that you don't, uh, when you finally share it with others, you don't, uh, uh, you don't keep all of that history. This is a mixed blessing because now you've broken the property uh, that, the, that the hashes are consistent and stable. And so if you've ever shared a commit with someone and then you rebase and collapse that history, now the hashes don't match up. So you have to have... Uh, if you're going to use rebasing, you have to be sort of thoughtful about how you do it as you collaborate with others. Um, and and it, it can, ends up being this tension between how, how pretty do you want your commit history to be versus, uh, versus how, you know, how much uh, work do you want to do to keep it in that form. All right, so uh, I'm going to go through with a tutorial in a sec, but um, basics of getting Git on, on, on Linux, it's easy. You just app git install git. On Windows, uh, there's a variety of different options broadly. One that I, I, I've had much fun with of late is that I highly recommend the Linux subsystem uh, for Windows. This is an, uh, uh, an optional, uh, it's technically I think still in beta, uh, feature you can turn on in Windows 10 where you get a bash prompt and you can actually have a copy of Debian or Ubuntu. Um, and then everything sort of works like Linux sort of contained within Windows. Um, you can also do Segwin. I don't recommend that these days. Segwin has largely been abandoned in all kinds of horrible ways. Um, there is a native version of Git that you can use as well. Um, so Git usage, um, you can easily initialize a repository, add files into it, commit, commit uh, a change to them, make more edits, commit those changes. And so from your point of view, you're just, you've got your files, you're making a bunch of edits, and eventually you'll, you'll want to push and pull those changes. Um, there's a, a notion of pushing your changes to some remote server and pulling uh, changes from a remote server. That involves both doing a fetch, getting information about all the objects that that server knows about that your local copy does not, and then doing a merge of whatever branch you're attempting to pull from uh, and merging that in uh, with your changes. Um, one of the reasons for the popularity of Git, aside from it having this, this sort of nice model that you can just put on a, on a, on a board and present in three, you know, three types of objects and whatnot, it's very appealing and attractive and simple. Um, but uh, GitHub is this uh, uh, service that uh, uh, was an independent company, recently was acquired by Microsoft actually, um, where they offer free hosting for, uh, for open source projects and uh, reasonable rates for, for closed source projects. Um, they have a bunch of features that make uh, using Git sort of even more attractive. The, the classic model, the way that Linus Torvalds imagined that you would use Git is each developer would have their local copy of the repository, they would work on it, they would periodically receive patches from various folks uh, and, and they might merge those in and, and, and operate that way. Um, GitHub uh, works within the confines of, of having this, this model of, of, uh, of repositories but puts your repository up uh, on a uh, on a shared hosted website where others can see it, and so effectively everybody can push and pull from your repositories, and so you're sort of working in public to the degree that you or, or with a set of collaborators if you're operating with a private repository, um, and they integrate in a bunch of tools for uh, making it easy to uh, to uh, tell others that you want to have a certain piece of code pulled in, uh, with the so-called pull request. It lets you, uh, it has it, it, for simple commits, there's an integrated editor, although there's some limitations there. Um, you can view the source code and look at, look at it with syntax highlighting. Um, and uh, yeah, a bunch of, it has integrated web hosting even for the project, so lots of, lots of fun stuff. There's notion of organizations and all of that. Um, a, a related product that is, is very handy for, for open source projects uh, is Travis CI, for, uh, Continuous Integration. Um, this lets you uh, have your GitHub project um, pre-commit when you're doing pull requests or post-commit when you've actually committed. Go and build your project and confirm that everything's working, run all your tests, and post all of that centrally. So you can, uh, you can even set this up with various pre-submit pre checks and whatnot so that uh, you can make sure that with a group of people working together... Travis, 
Um, it's similar, so it's similar in idea to Jenkins, but uh, in, this, uh, in the same way that, uh, in, in sort of, not a, well, not an exact analogy, but sort of, you can think of uh, Travis CI is to, is to Jenkins as GitHub is to Git. So it's a service that you can set up for your repository that will do the continuous build without you having to set up your own Jenkins server and all of the things for it. And it, and for, it is not based on Jenkins, so in that sense it's different. But it's, it's a continuous integration system. All you have to do to use it, which is really, really handy, uh, is you add a .travis YAML file to your project describing how to build it, what its dependencies are, um, and then you, it will go and run your, your stuff. There's a whole bunch of options in here. This is, this is actually the one that I, I put in for um, uh, my WWW basic. Um, but basically, you can, uh, you can it, it, they have a, a farm of uh, VMs with uh, Linux and, and Mac uh, systems that, that they'll fire off and build, build your stuff. And um, it is also possible if you hand over um, uh, appropriate keys to them to have them also upload the, the binary artifacts. You could even have it generate a release for you um, uh, at the end of all that. Um, they, last I had looked at their offerings in detail, they were still supporting only Linux and OS X. Um, there is another company I've forgotten the name of that offers a similar but not, not identical uh, uh, feature to do Windows. Um, and I have used that once, but it, basically the, the problem you run into with all of these is that their business model, as with GitHub, is that they're offering these free to open source projects, and then they're hoping to, uh, to charge you money for, for closed source things. And so what the level quality of service that you get uh, free varies over time and whatnot. Um, one positive thing, at least with uh, GitHub being acquired by Microsoft, is there's deep enough pockets that they'll likely continue to, to uh, uh, support uh, free things or sometime. And I said that they support, uh, uh, they're, they're free for, for open source. They even are starting to let you on GitHub uh, do private repositories to some degree uh, without, without paying, which is fascinating. You didn't have it free. Yeah. We have Pro for free. Mm -hmm. uh, pro, okay, yeah. I think there's a, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. So they're trying to get everyone young. It's good. Um, all right, so now let's move over to a tutorial. How are we doing on time? We're is that two fifteen? I started at one thirty. Wow, that took longer than I expected. All right, um, I have till three. Okay, um, all right. let's. Um, yeah. So let's. All right. So let's. Um, let's actually first kind of. I just want to walk folks through. Um, how this would work. I, I had intended to show uh, setup for Windows, but I, my Windows machine is over there. I think I'm going to skip that part. Uh, if, if folks have a, a Windows system and would like me to walk them through setup there, it can be a little bit of a challenge just because you're, you, if you're trying to look to get it to in, integrate with uh, what you expect as your editor and whatnot, there can be some wrinkles. Yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, give us a demo of how this would work. So imagine that you're going to uh, create some new project called Foo. Um, and let's even, uh, let's even say it was a fourth project. So um, let's, uh, so I, I frequently use this sort of an incantation to uh, oops, I can't type today. So imagine I've got hello world and forth, if you can read that. And I create this, run this, that's great. And now what I would like to be able to do now is to uh, keep some history in this. All I have to do, get init, that creates an empty repository in the current directory. Whenever I have a new file, I will add it like that. Now git is aware of that file, if I do git status, you can, you can see the status of, of that file. Um, if I do git commit, it commits it currently pending files, ah, but it's angry because I have not configured. So um, I use several accounts in this laptop. So one thing you'll encounter early on with git is that it uh, wants to know when you make commits who you are so that it can record uh, this in your, uh, uh, in your commit message. Um, you can... 
you can so get dash m allows you to uh, have a message that will be displayed uh, as your commit message and do that all on the command line. Um, this this is a potentially one-time setup to configure your account. Um, you can do as it says here in the instructions and set up a global uh, a, a global uh, set of options. Um, I'm going to actually just do this uh, locally. If you do it without the global, it does it for the current repository. Um, so now, um, so now all the commits that I make will be will have this name associated with it. So if I now do, uh, so yeah, as Don is saying, if you do something like you know, uh, like uh, this dash m, it will it will uh, commit with that uh, that message uh, as the commit message. Alternatively, it will go and uh, try to open up your default editor, in my case it's VI, and give you the option to describe in more detail uh, your commit. Um, this lets you describe what you've, what you've changed um, of a hello world in fourth program. All right. So now I've got this, this uh, here. If I, um, just to poke around a little bit, um, you'll notice that there's a, a hidden file dot, dot git. This is where the actual local repository is stored. If we go inside of here, there's a bunch of different stuff. Um, one of the more interesting ones is here are these objects, uh, and they're actually stored. Um, oopsie, come on. They're actually stored directly in here. Um, let me actually, uh, if we do git log, this shows the history, uh, and so far we have this one commit. You'll see this the single hash. Um, if I take that hash and do git cat file p, I can print out that, that actual commit. And you'll see that the, it has a tree. That tree has the, the one blob for that file. Suppose, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Let, let, me, let me make another commit and we'll, we'll demo that. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, so, suppose I instead decide I wanted to say hello svfig. So you'll note that I can say git diff and it will show me uh, a diff. The red is things that are being removed, being added. Um, and if I now do git commit and dash a, mm -hmm. so you're you have two ways you can go about uh, coping with uh, changes with commit with git. You can either explicitly git add each individual file that you're uh, you're modifying to let git know that this is sort of in in the frame for this commit, or if you do dash a, any files that git already knows about will be included as part of the commit. Um, the Careful caveat there is that if you've introduced new files that Git is unaware of, it will happily ignore them. So this only includes files that are already in the repository. So you'll notice here there's all this other text. Um, anything with a hash sign in front, it will ignore. This is its way of providing uh, information and instructions uh, in your editor. And so if you, you know, remove these hash lines, this would become part of your commit message. But you're basically free to put uh, an arbitrary message here. We could say changed message to greet svfig. All right. So now if we do get long the history of this thing, we now see two commits in, in succession. Um, and that top one is the, is the latest greeting. Now let's, um, let's now see how this plugs into, uh, into GitHub. So if I go to GitHub, um, so, um, this is my, my GitHub account. And if you go to github.com, you can readily create an account. Um, and um, one thing you'll, you'll notice in the fourth community, we have a couple of different, uh, there's, a, there's a fourth hub group that uh, I believe it's some of our European friends that have added very practically everyone they can find affiliated with fourth. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's a number of other groups I'm a member of. And so you can, you can be an affiliate of, of various groups. Um, let me go ahead and let's suppose I want to create a new repository. Um, and we'll just go ahead and for the purposes of this exercise, create a repository named foo. So 
Um, in GitHub, what's great is that I can have a repository affiliated with my username, and uh, I'm, I'm Flagzor, by the way, um, and it will uh, go ahead and, and uh, create this. Now, this is, uh, once I do this, if I use the defaults, this will be a public repository, and others can see this. Um, so I can go ahead and create a repository. Um, so I now have a repository, repository called Foo. And initially, this repository doesn't, uh, doesn't have any, um, uh, any commits in it, so there's nothing to show. Um, and there's sort of two ways you can cope with that. One option, if you're creating a new repository, you could start from GitHub. And there's an o various options when you create the repository. I should have shown this before I clicked onto the next screen. Uh, that will create a default readme file and various things. And that will let you get going without having to, to, to bootstrap um, on the client. Um, the other option, of course, now is that now that we've created this empty repository, we can hook it up with the work that we've done locally. And this is a one-time step. Um, before you can do any of that, a thing that you will need to, to do to make life convenient um, is that you will need to uh, enable uh, your local Git to be able to talk to GitHub. Um, and so, you'll, so a couple different ways you can do this. The, the way I recommend is actually getting a set of SSH keys set up. And so um, the, uh, what you'll need to do is uh, go through the steps to, to create an SSH key for your, your local system. You also can do this over HTTPS. Um, the wrinkle there is that uh, it's a little more tedious to cache the credentials. The, the nice thing about SSH is that uh, you can have your local uh, key set up once, and once you've done that, you can push and pull to GitHub without it prompting you for a password. Um, when, you configure, um, when you configure your account, one of the things that you can do uh, is under security here somewhere. Oops. That's not right. I'm looking at the wrong place. Um, if we go to, hold on, that's not what I want. Come on, am I not seeing, ah, hold on, there we go. Sorry, tiny, tiny little laptop screen. It was So if I go to uh, my profile, that's me, and you can, you can do all these socially things with it. Um, where is the setting for, oops, oh, they dashboard. Why am I not? All right, okay. That's strange. All right, of course they've managed to, cha to, to change where they keep the, uh, the settings. Oops, now I'm right clicking when I should be. Uh, settings, here we go. Okay, so if you go into settings for your profile, um, what you can do is actually configure uh, a set of SSH keys and you have multiple different devices associated with your, um, with your uh, uh, particular device. Um, and you can, you can basically add these. Um, this blue laptop, right, is, is the SSH key for this, uh, this particular uh, thing. You'll, you'll need to take, the, the, uh, uh, you'll need to take the, the public key associated with your local SSH, uh, and then that will allow you to push and pull from GitHub without any further fuss. So let's go back to Foo. Crap, we need to go, actually, let's go back to, so the, the URL space up here, github.com, username, and then uh, foo, this is the repository that we were just creating. If we use this uh, path, that's how we would set things up. So what we can do is just literally copy these two lines, and that will let us uh, hook up the commits and push the changes that we'd made locally uh, to GitHub, if we now reload, now we've got that history up here. We've got testfs up here. It shows this fourth file. Because it's .fs, it's, it's actually showing a little bit of syntax highlighting, although it's hard to see. Um, you can see, you can click on blame to see a view of it where um, the colors are dreadful on here, but you can see uh, the upper lines are from 
that initial commit, and then it highlights the fact that this middle line happened in the second commit. Um, and then um, this, uh, this is up sort of for all to see. Um, let's, let's make another, uh, another commit just to, so a typical thing you would have here is a readme file. And um, let's actually, we'll demonstrate, actually let me demonstrate something a little more advanced. So um, a typical pattern if you're trying to uh, work with others and you actually, so two ways you can collaborate, uh, well there's many ways you can collaborate with Git, but uh, um, a useful one uh, is, is to use pull requests. And a pull request is the notion that you make a change, uh, pot a potential change, and you let someone else take a look at that change before you agree to commit it uh, to a common place. Um, so for example, let's say I wanted to create some new uh, feature, let's call this feature bar, and you can do checkout dash B to create the repo. So now I'm off on a branch called bar that's based upon the current state of the world. If I now add a readme.md file, um, md is markdown, uh, let's, and git has some integration with markdown. So uh, sample test fourth program. Uh, this is a sample program to demonstrate using Git and GitHub with fourth. Um, so that that uh, will get visualized. Uh, the the star will will. Um, uh, sorry, that's not the right hash sign. No, ah, it's been a while. Mark down, folks in the audience. Refresh my memory. Is it two? two Two hashtags. Ah, that sounds right. All right. Uh, this will be a great example if we got it wrong here. All right, so I now add that, that file, and I can... Yeah, that, so if you do paths and, like, the current directory, it will add everything there, and that's a, yeah, if you're... Um, and the only reason they do that is so you could conceivably commit one file but not the other. It's kind of an unfortunate default. Um, Adding a readme file. So let's say we add this readme file. Um, and now you'll notice that if you do git branch, we're on this branch called bar. So we're off doing something separate from master and editing bar. If we now do git push, it's going to complain at us because we haven't yet decided that bar is a branch that we want to have up in our server. We can go ahead and copy this line and add bar as a, um, as a branch. Origin is, the, uh, is a reference to this uh, remote server. And that will now push this other branch up to GitHub. So if we go back to, to GitHub and go back up to the top of this, so you'll see we've got master, but we've also got bar over here. And in bar, we can see this readme. And now notice it's formatted with markdown because we did the proper, we, we actually did get the formatting right. But you'll notice when we go back to, uh, to master that uh, it, it shows us this option. You're recently pushed branches. And it offers us the option to, do, to compare and create a pull request. And so this would be a, a way for you to, uh, and you could do this based on your repository, but you could also do it based on someone else's repository. If you had a change you wanted to send to them. So you could take a look at this change. It will show you a look, here's this single commit, and there's the difference. We added this one file, and we could create a pull request uh, where, where we're asking to merge this into to master on this other uh, Branch. And, you, and this can get arbitrarily complex. You can merge to master, but you imagine a project with lots of folks working on multiple branches they could, that you could merge to a variety of branches. If we create this pull request, now under this, this repo, you'll see one pull request. And if this, I'm seeing this here, I sent this pull request to myself effectively. Um, but you could imagine uh, you could imagine sending this to someone else, and they receive this pull request and could decide to merge it in. Um, if you had uh, Travis set up, as I described, uh, with that dot, dot uh, Travis YAML file, uh, at this point, what we would be seeing is Travis busily in the background building this commit, and it would be yellow as it was trying to build the commit. If we had it configured properly, you could have it. Uh, 
refuse to let you merge until, uh, until Travis has completed and successfully built your tests, all of that. Um, or we can simply merge this pull request. Um, and it asks us to confirm. And so now if we look at the, um, if we now go back and look at the history here, if we go back to the code, um, we'll see that we now have this, this readme here. And there's a history of four commits. There's this, in, there's this initial commit. We changed it to svfig. We added the readme, and then we merged it in. So the readme was off in a branch. Um, there's a tool at the commit. So if we, so you'll note that GitHub can see that. Those changes happen up on GitHub. If I want to see those changes locally, I need to pull over here. So now my local copy has all of this information. So if I go to git log, so I'm on the bar branch, and I can see that adding the readme, the changing the message. If I go and check out master and look at the log, oops, I need to, oh, I closed, what did I do? All right, so, so now if I do git log on this branch, I can see the merge, adding the readme, the change message. Uh, there's a program called git k that will let you, whoopsie, but I don't have, all right. So you have to have uh, git k installed, which apparently now it's a separate package. Uh, git k will let you uh, sort of see the, the structure of commits um, locally on your system after you've actually installed it. I don't find that I use it much for a variety of reasons, but it can be helpful if you're kind of puzzling over what happened with a commit. Oh, one other interesting thing to note, you'll notice that each of these commits has a hash associated with it, and they've shortened it, just showing the first few characters. Um, all right. So you'll notice that here, this sort of visualizes what we did. We had this initial commit. We cha made a change. We went off onto a branch and bar, and then we merged that commit back into master. Now, a different way that you can do all of this is, uh, is through, the, uh, through, the, through the web interface. So if I decide that, um, let's suppose that I wanted to go and uh, edit, this, uh, edit this readme file, I can go over here and click on edit. And I could change this to say something like, uh, whoops, run test.fs to run the sample. Um, and then yeah, I can even preview the changes. It'll show me the, the formatted markdown. Um, and you can do this with the source code as well, only with a single file, unfortunately. And then I can say, I can describe my change, you know, uh, added. Uh, uh, yeah, so this, this uh, top line goes in the top line of the commit message, and then uh, and you ha at a minimum want to have something there. The rest of it goes typically with one ex extra line in between uh, in the remainder of the commit message. Right, and, and that is very important, by the way. You want to have pithy, pretty concise commit messages uh, that capture sort of what changed. Um, it's annoying when you've got this long, run on long sentences. Yeah, keep, keep them short. Keep them, keep them 80 characters, you know? Um, so there's two, notice there's two options here, right? We can commit this directly, or let's, let's do the exercise of creating another branch, right? So here it's letting us create a branch and propose a file change. So now I've created this other branch uh, where I now have another pull request here. Oops, I think I, needed, I did not finish creating, the, I did not push the button to create the pull request. Two clicks. Uh, so now there's a, there's a pull request uh, pending on this. And, you can, and somebody who is on the receiving end of this would see this pull request to um, adding the instructions. And they can go in and look at this pull request and Merge the pull request, let's say. And now this pull, and if you go back and look at the pull request, you'll see that there's two closed pull requests. I can look at the history 
And the key thing here is all the history is kept, right? So I can see that, look, there were these two pull requests and who merged them and when they got merged. Um, and now if I go back to the code, it's, it's updated. Um, if I look at the commits, I can see the, their relationship and how the merges happen. Um, just to demonstrate uh, how, uh, let's, let's demonstrate how Travis looks just to give you a sense. So here's a, here's a project that uh, has Travis turned on. And um, what Travis will do for you is it will show you this status about whether or not the project builds. If you click on that status, um, come on. Uh, you can go back and actually see, oh, look, it tried to run at this particular commit. It has the history of what actually transpired in the build at that commit and the history of various things building. Um, if you create a pull request, it will attempt to build the change against the latest version. And so, for example, there's this long-standing pull request someone sent me that has not been merged. It actually looks like it builds. Um, one other cool thing is that there's all kinds of other checks here. I, I, for this project, I need to enforce that they have agreed to the appropriate license. And so here it tells me that they have. This person has actually added a polar graphing example. Um, so I can look at their pull request and see uh, what, what's in here. I can go down and look at the, the commits that make up the pull request. The pull request can potentially contain multiple commits. Um, you, you, could, you would typically want to rebase your commits to, um, to show them. I can look at this one commit and see what is this guy asking me to, oops, that's not the right place to click. Um, so I can look at the files change to see what will change here. And he's proposing to, um, what is he doing here? He's adding this polar grapher HTML file some brand new example, and he's updated the README. I'm having, oh, they're covering the text. No, no, go away. Got it. Um, so he's added these few lines to link to his new example. So he's adding a file, adding a link to his example here. Um, I will look at this later as I have I'm not sure if I want to merge it or not. I probably want to confirm. The good thing is I know at least that it builds, right? Travis came back, it built it successfully, all of those things. Um, as we're running out of time, let's, let's uh, I had in, also intended to show folks the tools with, uh, with the ESP for it, but I think we don't have time for that. Let's quickly pivot to, or do we want to do this later with your talk? We can show off the, the ESP. Yeah, let's, let's wait on that. Let's merge our talk. Yeah, or, yeah. Sounds, sounds good. Um, so I'm realizing in going through that, that, that was probably incomprehensible if you're, you haven't played with these tools and probably was not as helpful as what I had originally intended when I conceived of this talk. No, you're wrong. Okay. Great. Okay. That was a great talk. Thank you. All right. Any, any, any questions? I think I think one of the one of the, the very cool things about it broadly is that right we presented how it, how it works internally those three types of objects and that's very straightforward yeah yeah um and they may have integrations with other folks but I mean it certainly works what repository. I don't think you can. Yeah, I think it only. Yeah, 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 yeah. I. They. It is. So I mean, they're a commercial company, and they do things all the time. So it may be that they've uh, got other mechanisms for integration. But they're pretty heavily attached to GitHub. So I would be surprised if they have much in the way of. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, you could certainly set up Jenkins and 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 what. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't talk about that. I don't want to talk about the hooks. <laughs> the hooks are a nightmare. That's a whole other. <laughs> um, but um, I, the, thing, the thing I would emphasize is that part of what is cool about the pair of GitHub and Travis is that, in some sense, if you're not interested in 
being in the business of administering all of this stuff, now you don't have to run your own source control server. Now you don't have to run your own uh, continuous integration farm, all of these things. And so to the degree that you can, you can uh, uh, delegate that to someone who can keep all that stuff up and running, that can make your life simpler. So. Just because something is easy doesn't mean. <laughs> well, anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in general, I think one one th theme that I think to to also take away is that um, one of the more powerful things here is the ability to go off and uh, make a change and then merge with, with the work of others. I think that a uh, a, a frequent problem I you know, remember folks encountering with earlier version control systems is that usually if there was any overlap in what you were doing, uh, merges would get really hard really fast. Git is remarkably effective at merging as long as there is not genuine overlap. And it's not too bad to cope with, with merges uh, because it uses a variety of strategies when it goes and attempts to do a merge. Unless something goes wrong. Yeah, well. I don't know about that. I remember fighting with CBS quite a bit for bad merges. Yeah. I, I, I think the, 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 the horrible situations I've encountered with Git, with that number of files, I would, I would, yeah. I would never want to deal with it with it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, Garrett, so yeah, Garrett. Garrett is integrates a bunch of a bunch of these facilities that are that are uh, that GitHub does. It's um, one nice thing with Garrett is that it does cope in some ways a little bit better with rebases. Um, GitHub doesn't like rebases very well. So if you're going to go changing your history, they they've recently gotten a little bit better. Like if you make a change to a pull request and where you rebase re it and you've actually changed the commit and push it up. It used to be it would confuse it in all kinds of horrible ways. It's gotten a little bit better. Garrett, the workflow, the, the Android folks that were doing this, they were typically doing rebases a lot and so uh, it, it tends to cope with that better. Right. Yeah. No. It's, it's good to uh, be able to have GitHub, uh, Git to control your source. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have, you know, like Jenkins to do continuous mm -hmm. integration. But you, you, know, you want to be able to have show what everybody's doing. At least mm -hmm. they can put a status in what, they, yeah. what they've done. So, some of that, there is a little bit of flavor of that in, in, with, uh, with, uh, with GitHub. And, and GitHub has a bunch of things around. There's a, there's a built-in issue tracker. There's a bunch of uh, things where you can sort of associate the uh, individual commits with the issues and, and, and some of those things. So it's a similar, similar to Garrett. There's right. sort of, and I would say, yeah, Garrett is a good example of a, of a uh, standalone uh, uh, server that will accomplish many of the same kinds yes. of things as, yes. as GitHub. I would say that in terms of user friendliness, GitHub is, is a little more user friendly. Yes. Uh, Garrett has sort of got a lot of density to the text to it. Exactly. Um, but it, as I mentioned, yeah, with rebases in particular, Garrett can be nice. Yes, but like I said, I just, I'm so paranoid, you know, because when I found out that GitHub got acquired by Microsoft. <laughs> yes. You know, I was going, oh, Microsoft, guess what they're doing? They're looking at the source. They go, oh, what can we steal here? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge if you're. Yeah, but, but oh they're, yeah. They're is what they are. Yeah. So. Brad, yes. Do you know anybody who's been Garrett other than Android? Um. Yes. Uh, did, do uh, Do I know anyone using Garrett other than Android? Um. So. So. Uh, so, so we're, we're, we had recently, or, yeah, when I departed uh, working on Chrome, we were using it, starting to use it there as well. So, yeah. Uh, and we had used it for various sub-projects going the way tool back. Tool? Uh, yeah. Garrett? Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> so. Hmm? Is it based on Google Code Review? Uh, it's influence. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the influence and history of it. Yeah. I mean, there's a long lineage to Google's Code Review tools. So. Yeah. 
going going back to to back to Guido Van Ross and joining Google and saying, "Wait, what? You're sending around <laughs> sending around patches?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah. Cool. Any other? distributed concept is now you've got this monster repository on your local yeah. machine. That, that, that is, only that, 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 and that is actually, especially as projects get larger and yeah. larger, problematic. Like Android. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's one, one problem is, yeah, you've you got the whole repository. And all the history, all the especially, history. a thing that I, I've seen folks get very sort of uh, into big trouble with get around is if you have any amount of checking in of binaries into your repository, you're going to hate life because now all of those are with you forever and ever at every version. Um, the, um, <laughs> well, it is, no, it's, I mean, in some sense, you could say that Git is actually kind of a blockchain, right? It is in the it sort of is, right? Um, in fact, I'm not sure it did influence. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that mindset is certainly what influenced it. One way you can kind of work around that is there is this facility called submodules that has gradually gotten better and better. Right. You can, there are ways of dealing yeah. with the problem. But, but yeah, and, and the challenge there is that you have to, uh, you're able to have sub-repositories that you uh, include in, into your, uh, your repository and you link to them at certain commits. And so they, all that becomes a part of the history of the repository with the dependency is what revision you're dependent on. But uh, the trouble is that uh, the trouble is that that, uh, that assumes that you have carefully decomposed things such that you can make that work well. Um, and, and God help you, you have to merge across those boundaries. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, the author of the code base mm -hmm. manages what is added. So the cool, the cool kind of so so the cool thing about about the Git model is that everybody is the is their, the maintainer of their own their own uh, uh, copy of the world, and so in principle. Uh, so, so literally the way Linus Torvalds does this with the Linux kernel is he has his particular copy of the, the world and he chooses what he, want, he is willing to merge in and whatnot. Someone else can do their own set of things and independently uh, merge or not merge things uh, on their various branches. And so, yes, the individual maintainer chooses what to merge, but that's each, each uh, individual mem member interacting is on that same footing. And part of that model is present on... on uh, uh, in GitHub. One, oh, one key feature on GitHub I didn't mention is uh, for every, you can go browsing other folks' projects on GitHub and, uh, and just simply go and click the fork it button and you'll fork it into your repository and now you have a, a complete copy of their, uh, their repository, all of its history, and can go off and do your own thing with it. And, and the, you can post it. And you can post it. You can and send them post. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways. Yep. And uh, that otter is taking a break. And I suggest we emulate him. Go to sleep. So it's break time. If you're not doing anything, you might look at Strix yeah. demo here. It's interesting. I commend it to you.
now you're locked. Here. <laughs> All right, Don Golding here. Um, we're working on a new project. Um, can you go grab a board? Which is the uh, the new um, AI bot uh, controller? It's the, that controller right there, and um, it has a myriad of sensors and things. So. Uh, Brad's going to give a little talk about the tools that you have to put on the board or that you have to use for um, some development. Long term, you're going to be able to use the Arduino IDE, but uh, short term, we have to use the, the tools from uh, ESP. So, <clears throat> you know, it's a system on module, which means that you give it power, um, RS-232, there's transmit, receive. And um, you do have to give it CTS and RTS. And when I laid out the board, I forgot to hook up CTS, which is this one right here. <laughs> um, for high-speed communications, RTS, CTS is important. If it's 9600 baud, you know, it, usually you don't have to uh, hook those up. But this chip uses the serial port for downloading code. So it, it, it kicks up to, I think, 900 kilohertz. Uh, when it's in the download mode. So anyway, that's one of the jumpers on the board. <coughs> um, so it's system on module. It's got a uh, reset pin that you have an external um, pull-up resistor, which should be 10K. And then um, I had put a, a 1K and a 1 microfarad cap. And it turns out they wanted a much slower... Um, um, reset on because you want to have the power rails come up before the chip resets. So we modified that and um, did a little web search. People said a 10 mic and a 10K, so we up, we did that. Um, the RS-232 uh, is working fine. Uh, we can talk to the chip. The, the chip has a bootloader on it and it comes up and it displays text so you can tell you know, if something, something's wrong. So the next step was um, Dr. Ting and Brad worked on a, a fourth kernel uh, for the CSP processor, which Dr. Ting has working on a development board. And uh, we downloaded it to the, the CSP processor. And we're having a lot of trouble with the flash part of the, of the system. Now, the flash is on this you know, system, you know, system on a board, system on a chip. Um, it has nothing to, you know, it has nothing to do with my circuit. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit of a, a mystery where we're trying to figure it out. You know, maybe there's some noise on the power supply or something. I'm going to be looking at that stuff next. But um, we have one board that is operating and uh, over here that uh, Brad programmed so we're going to show that. Brad's going to um, show how to use the ESP tools, which is really important. I've downloaded those to my laptop. And um, that's basically where we're at with the project. You want me to talk about the circuit? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, I'll talk about the circle a bit. What's that? Okay, so here's the microprocessor circuit. This is actually a circuit board, not a processor. So um, <clears throat> on this board, you have Wi-Fi, you have Bluetooth, you got um, uh, 440K of uh, RAM. And you have flash. You have an external. There's a an, an ESP32 on it, and then on the little circuit board, there's an external flash, and that's what we're having trouble with. <coughs> um, so it's pretty simple. Um, this chip over here is a USB to serial chip. So you can see the circuit's very simple. You know, this is a 
I use the, the mini USB, which is much bigger and heavier than the, the micro. Um, I'm always replacing cables on my cell phone. <laughs> I wanted something more reliable, so I used the bigger one. But you can see it's a pretty simple circuit to talk to, the, uh, talk to this. This will support the Arduino IDE. This is from their, um, this circuit is from one of their development boards. So one of the things you have to do when you turn the board on, you want to program it, you have to jumper this, you have to short this jumper here. And um, that, then you'll see on the, the terminal, you'll see waiting for download. So that tells you that it's ready to download in the flash. When we got that far, that works. You want to go through the whole circuit? Maybe we're finishing the, the stuff about uh, IOPIN 12. Yeah, I, well, why don't you talk about 12? So, uh, one, one other issue we overcame is that the, no, no, I don't know, that's here. Uh, um, one, other, one other issue we ran into is that um, despite this being a, a, a self-contained uh, uh, board with the flash inside, um, it does support a mode where you boot from external flash instead of the internal flash. And so for that reason, there are a bunch of external pins that you can use to configure the voltage at which it flashes. Um, we had, Don and I think, assumed that we could uh, just use this as the tw pin 12 as, as a, uh, a general purpose I.O. pin, but it's also used to select the, uh, the voltage of the flash on startup. Um, he had it pulled high, which defaults it to 1.8 volt. Um, it seems from what we can tell that the, uh, the, these particular devices, the internal flash is a, is a 3.3 volt. Um, two ways that you could work around that, one that would make, disable this is to pull that low. The other is that there's a fuse, one-time fuse that you can set that overrides it and sets it to 3.3 volt for the flash uh, uh, and then disregards the value of that pin. Although because we don't have the flash up stable, you know, this is just our, op you know, this seems to be from observation uh, what's going on, although uh, in general the issue we're having is that uh, although we fairly, with the boards that are working with the serial, they fairly consistently come up and you can talk to them over serial, but the flash comes up, you know, maybe one time out of ten or one time out of five, depending on what kind of mood it's in, uh, which is the, the core problem we're, we're struggling with now. So, yeah, so with that, uh, did, shall I demo on here or there? Which, what do you fancy? Uh, okay, let me, why don't we do it on here just because I'm um, I've had better, I can probably drive this in my sleep a little more. So, um, so um, one, one issue is that the, uh, the board that we're, or the, the chip that's being used is the, uh, the ESP32 uh, Solo. Uh, this is a, a fairly new variant of the ESP32 that has a single core. And unfortunately, Arduino does not yet have support uh, for that variant of, uh, of the ESP32. Um, for that reason, uh, We've had to use the uh, the uh, the uh, IDF uh, SDK directly. Um, so um, uh, the the thing that someone following along that would need to do to set all of this up is to actually install um, the uh, the SDK. Um, you can uh, if you search for ESP IDF SDK. You can uh, go to their getting started guide, and um, you'll want to you want to go through each of the each of the steps. Um, for Linux, you you have to have a bunch of dependencies uh, installed. Um, on this particular system, I built the whole the whole shebang from source, which I, is what I would recommend if you're on Linux. It's not too bad to do that on Windows. There's a an installer that if you download that. It, you can pick various pre-built versions. Um, it does have an option, by the way, to build uh, from tip of trunk, but when I tried it, it was flaky, so I wouldn't recommend that. But the, very, the, the, the latest, uh, the latest uh, stable release, I believe, has, it, it does work with the, these chips is for, uh, uh, identically. So once you have all of that, um, so for Windows, that, that does a bunch of stuff for you. It, it will install a copy of, of Git. Uh, it, it will install a copy of the Extensa uh, toolchain. It will install uh, their, their libraries. It will install 
um, uh, a copy of Python, a, a bunch of stuff, uh, and then it, it has it creates a, uh, a Windows uh, sh uh, shortcut that brings you up with a command prompt with all of those tools in the path and all of that. Um, with Linux, um, you can clone this Git repo, uh, and then there's a bunch of uh, dependencies you have to. Uh, to install and it will scream at you if you don't have those dependencies. And then the net result is if you uh, let's just bring up a new terminal. Um, there, there's a script uh, that I've included in my, my bash RC uh, which is, does the equivalent of, of what they do in that startup script on Windows. Uh, this last line where you uh, pull in their ex exports. Um, and then you'll have all of the tools in their path. Um, couple of key tools. Um, oh, one other thing we're struggling through there. So the main, that tool chain, um, it installs this thing called IDF, um, which is good. There's also um, a thing called ESP tool, which is the same tool that's used for both uh, a, a, a two, six, a, uh, the, the, the ESP8266 and, and ESP32. Um, it has a bunch of uh, uh, utilities that are kind of handy. If you want to set that up, um, you, if you just search for ESP tool, there's, uh, you can clone the, the first repository that comes up. Um, that tool lets you do a couple things with the board. Let me, um, let me go ahead and power cycle this. It's temp oh, in case it doesn't come up ever again, you can see here we're blinking Morse code. and It was unplugged from the machine, which is, you know, it, it doing its own thing. So, but let's, we're going to reset and, and tempt fate here. Um, so, um, so with ESP tool, a thing that, that pretty consistently works is chip ID, oopsie. Let me, oh, I got it. Pull that. Come on. That's, don't say things like tempt fate. Come on. Okay. Uh, 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 oh, you know what we're going to need? We're going to so um, you for most of the interaction with the chip, you'll get something like this. Um, so you'll definitely get this uh, if you try to flash the device and, and the jumpers are not set. Um, but you'll also get that if you're uh, if you are trying to do an operation that it requires it to interact with the bootloader and you've uh, and you have not uh, attached the download pin, pin one, on the uh, to put it in download mode. So you can we can read the chip ID and we can see that it's an ESP thirty two D zero W D Q five. That that works fine. Um, the thing that is inconsistent and that we're struggling with is if we do flash ID, you'll notice that this gives us unknown manufacturer, a bunch of weird stuff. Um, if we toggle this. Do it again. Okay, now it's showing us four megs, and so that's that's exactly the inconsistency we're seeing is that it doesn't stably come up in a state where it can see uh, the flash size. Once it's up and, and working, it generally stays up and, and behaves itself. Why, uh, why did the device change? Because because it's unstable. This is the instability we're talking about. And so. Give it enough resets, it comes up and can talk to the flash. Once it's talking to the flash, it seems to stay in a state if you don't power cycle it where, where it doesn't uh, lose that. But, but yeah, it's, it's perplexing. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, this particular utility, the flash, uh, flash ID, um, so in general, it will come up. If, if I don't use this flash ID tool, it comes up maybe one time out of 30. With the Flash ID tool, it's maybe one out of four, one out of three, something like that. So it's much more likely to come up if the first thing I do with it is to use this Flash tool, which again is sort of a further indication that something is up with the ordering or speed at which it comes up with the Flash. Um, so to give you a sense of, so at this point, right, we're talking to it over the serial port. The main CPU is up. Now the Flash is up. If we go over and do um, make monitor, whoops, I'm not, uh, I need to be actually in. Um, so I've started, by the way, putting the changes to, to ESP fourth, Dr. Ting's fourth, up in the GitHub repository. If you go to flags or GitHub flags or uh, ESP fourth, you'll you'll see that there. Um, in in here is a project that's designed to be built with the the SDK. Um, so if you're in here, you can do make monitor. Actually, I'll show the commands from. So. Um, 
If you're on Unix, there's make files that do things here. Uh, on Windows and on Unix, you can use this IDFPy and, and run this monitor application. Um, and so you, you'll see right now it's sitting there waiting for in, in a download state. If I pull off this jumper and then reconnect it without the jumper, this would normally be what, uh, what would be the, the boot state. And it shows that it's trying to boot over and over again, but it's failing. Um, so the act of placing the jumper on here live will put it into a in the state where it's waiting for download. Um, so if I, the interesting thing though is if I do a reset like this a few times, okay, that's not, and get it into a happy place. Um, yeah, so, so until, so it's, you've got the CPU and this flash, and it, the CPU we're able to talk to robustly, but when you to query that flash, it's being inconsistent until it decides it's, got, it, until it happens to get lucky for whatever reason. And I think what's going on is that it's rebooting the flash, and it's doing it too fast or something, or a power thing, we're not sure. Um, in any event, once you get into this sort of acquiescent state, um, you can then uh, program it. I'm going to tempt fate here and, and go ahead and try to flash it. Um, so oh, actually, before I do that, let me show. So um, what I've got actually in here is a, there's a certain structure that uh, the ESP IDK, uh, uh, SDK requires your project to be in. And they have both CMake files and make files. And, and I put all the appropriate ones in here if you check this all out. Um, but this is just Ting's uh, uh, ESP forth in a single C file. Um, I've used some, some uh, pound defines to uh, make it both. I, there's actually a way to build it for, so it runs at the command line and on device. Um, and because this is uh, being built with their SDK, you're, you're actually hooking into the RTOS that they have on there. Um, so you have to have an app main, and that's its entry point. And then um, uh, the way, there's a configuration set step in here that I've added. Let's see, serial, where'd it go? Uh, where did I put the, oh yeah, stood in. So I've got some, uh, some code in here that uh, sets it up in a mode where uh, standard in and standard out are mapped to the serial port so that I can uh, just treat those as uh, coming in, in, in and out of the device. And then um, the, um, uh, let's see, so then, uh, lost my train of thought. So anyways, uh, we can now uh, build the application and it will go and build. Actually, let me show one other thing, sorry. Um, if you're, so if you're configuring this thing from scratch, um, so it, it has a, the build system here has a configuration for a whole bunch of options about um, what it, what kind of, how, the, how it builds the RTOS, what kind of Wi-Fi drivers, because all of the stuff uh, that comes with, with the SDK gets built into this. All of that gets stored into this SDK config file. Um, if you go um, and run IDFPy menu config, it brings up um, a, um, uh, an interactive menu to uh, let you choose those options. What I've checked into the repository is all, it's just the default configuration, um, but it does have um, one thing changed there's a component config, and if you go down here to, uh, oops, to free RTOS, um, there's this checkbox for run free RTOS, RTOS only on the first core, and you have to check that because these things have only one core on like all the other uh, ESP32 devices. So that's, that's the one tweak I've made on top of the defaults. And I'm not gonna save that because I don't wanna. So anyways, let's, let's be brave and, and we'll, do, I, we'll do the build. Well, the build won't isn't require bravery, but um, the annoying thing is, of course, we're building this teeny weeny little fourth, but then we have to build the entirety of the uh, their. Uh, and actually, this isn't building everything because it's got some stuff sitting there. The entirety of their uh, their whole stack. And now, if we do flash, it will go and flash the board, and it writes it out to the board. That worked. That that's yeah. <laughs> That's no small, uh, for what it's worth, I also feel like whenever it's been sitting up and running for a while, it tends to be more likely to succeed. All right, so now at this point, I'm going to try to remove the, the jumper 
And then I'm going to run the monitor. So this is just a serial monitor interacting with the board. And it's not booting, but let's give it a sec. So this is one of the issues is it's repeatedly, oh, there it went. So it's repeatedly trying to read the flash. The checksum is failing. So it tries again and tries again. And this time it, it got through. Um, I've left in a bunch of your, your, your print statements, Dr. Tang, and so it's printing out a memory dump uh, as well as printing out the, the, uh, the raw dump of the words. Um, but now we're up here, and you see it says IAI bot. Whoop, that's, I did word, not words. Uh, and so we've got fourth there. We can do decimal. We can do, uh, let's say, 100. Uh, actually, oops, let's go back. Let's go back. No, no. Okay, let's do, uh, let's do 0, 100, 4, uh, do print, plus 1, next, drop. So, yeah, so it's up and running. Um, I've got a, uh, let me open a, uh, Another window here. In, in, if you want, uh, want another slightly more uh, elaborate test file, um, checked in here. I've got this uh, SOS test, uh, which has, which uh, creates a delay just with an arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily large for loop. Um, it's turning on and off pin 13, uh, and then the, a dot is you know an on and an off of a certain delay before and afterwards. There's a gap. And so an SOS is just dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. So I'm going to take all of this and copy paste it into the terminal. And there it goes. If you, so we're, yeah. So the, yeah, so the, so the real trouble, the real trouble, and, and just to further, if I disconnect the, the system, it's, it's off and free running. So um, the, the problem, of course, is that in principle, from all we know, if I were to unplug this and replug it in, it should boot up and, and run the fourth. It does not do that, um, nor does it run any other of the, right, the, the Hello Worlds or any of those programs. So something is, uh, something is amiss, uh, and I have not yet, we have not yet been able to figure out what. Uh, it seems to pertain to that flash, but um, yeah. But is scope underpublished? Nope. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, tomorrow I'm going to be working on it, and yeah, that's the first yeah. thing that's I'm going to do. That's my first thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, if it had noisy power. Power is not good at, until it warms up. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what's, what's super mysterious is that it, I would have thought that uh, you'll notice how we had several rounds there where the where the flash ID came up wrong until it came up right. That what's weird about that is that that's not you know just the system. Maybe going through a reset process in that in that yeah. utility there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh no, the utility t tells it to do a, a, a reboot each time. Correct. So. And that's where your power issue will occur the most. Mm -hmm. Is in your power up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. may have something unstable. Too much power. Yeah. Yeah. And that I've had that many times. And it pulls too much power and then it drops power. Yeah. And then it comes back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what it's sounding like. Yeah. It, it's so simple that it's got to be hardware. I'm the hardware. Right. Guy. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I'm pointing to power. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is sounding simple. Yeah, well, it's got to be simple, right? That is an uh, interesting thing. I was watching a, a video when they were talking about creating low power circuits, and the biggest thing is power. Yes. It's having yes. stable, clean power. Yes. The lower you go, the more you've reduced your. What do they call it? The, the window. The window it's the, of it's, variability. It, it has to be more precise. Your noise margin. Your yeah. noise margin is very small. You can't have any noise at certain points in the boot string. Right. And, yeah. Well, you know, that's yeah. like, uh, you know, going from Intel is 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer <laughs> that they gave up on because they couldn't get it to work. Exactly. Because, and, that's a problem because you're you're you've got 
power constraints, you've got noise, you've got components that are feeding on each other, you know, things like that. And it's in the boot sequence that seems to be the biggest, the most susceptible. Agreed. Yeah. It's the boot sequence that, oh, well, you turn on a gate. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And is it going to grin? Yeah. <laughs> and you go away. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would attack there first. Yeah. For, for, fortunately, I am a terrible double E, so we'll have to lean on Don, and I, electricity is hard. I am not <laughs> an E. It is, it is hard. <laughs> Sulfuric acid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're a chemist. Okay. There's methods to kill the entire thing. We fried now. Has it three three boards? We fried, unfortunately. But all right. I guess I've they've been near my hands, so maybe. <laughs> Does it seem to change going from board to board? Oh, yes. Well, then you also have yeah. the, the ground. <laughs> it changes from hour to hour, too, but I mean. Versus the, your uh, data lines, right? How you're running those. Right. And yeah. whether your ground and power planes are large enough to. That, oh. That's the second thing, is your yeah. ground planes? Yeah. Well, OK, this, this is uh, the IO on this chip is very low speed turning transistor. Well, but inside that, that module, right? I mean, well, inside the module, but I don't have control over that. Correct. It, it, the problem is not inside the module. The module has been tested. <laughs> well, well, in fairness, this module is a fairly uh, new one that it is, you know, to give it isn't yet supported by our Arduino. So we are, have a hot off the presses module. It may be. But it's gone through some, some kind of manufacturing of, test. Fair enough, fair enough, yeah. They were able to put their software on it. True, true. And so the filter is already there. Yeah. And you know that the module is eh, fairly good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But whether its power supply is good, you may have some, you may need some decoupling logic on the data lines. Yeah, there's, there's something that I don't quite understand about the module because I don't believe the module itself. I did. To me, it has to be power. It's power. Yeah. That, that's what this is smelling like. Yeah. I mean, the... the, the you have to use that term, you? Huh? Smelling like... Oh, <laughs> exactly. Hardware has a smell. <laughs> Especially when you... Release the magic smell. When you let the <laughs> electrons loose, <laughs> it has, has a smell. Uh, you will never forget. Yes. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, you know, proper, uh, you know, a good ground plane and where you're running your, your data lines yeah. Yeah. from the chip all matter. Yeah. Because the closer they are, they can influence each other mm -hmm. at a distance. Right. You, it, you may plans. even have some crosstalk depending on how closely you put the lines. See, this like is all said, slow only, logic, though. The only data right. lines are the RS-232. That's it. And RS-232 is plain. Have you put a scope on this? <laughs> Next step. <laughs> no, I, I, will, I will triple check. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, one of the things about this chip is that, you know, when you're talking to it, it's 115K. But when it's programming, it's 900K, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there may be, there may be an issue. As a matter of fact, that's that's a good point. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe when it gets that's, up to the 100 k during programming, there's it into high speed mode when it's flashing. And uh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Don't discount the RS-232 yeah. lines. Yeah. That could be caused by. Maybe I have to put a pull up resistor on the two yeah, lines. You may have to put some kind of decoupling. Yeah, double check the data sheet on that first and two to make sure that the waveforms that you're getting are the same spec as well. And I've seen some really bad RS2 lines. Oh, really bad ones. Yeah, all of these systems are fine. Good. Mm -hmm.
just check. You at this point put a scope on every line. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, well, um, I've seen that uh, many digital circuits where because we're using CMOS and it's so low power, yeah. the drive strength of the Fed and the chip is really low, and you and you need a pull up even though it should go from logic one to the logic zero. It's not going all the way up, yeah. or it's going up kind of a rounded way. You know, it kind of rounds off the square wave, and then you put the pull up on there, and you have a nice square wave. So yeah. that. Well, that, that's the idea. Yeah. If it's arcing like that, you're going to get a different timing segment. Right. All of this can be affected there. Yeah. But you're right. This is... You gotta as the, I don't like pointing fingers at hardware. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, no, I, I, I say 90% chance it's hardware. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the hardware guy. So. You, you said that now. You said that. I don't like pointing fingers. Because it's usually software. Uh, I'm actually thinking that um, the pulling resistors on RS-232 may be the trick. Yeah. Look at it on a scope that's first, that's Don. That's look at it on a scope. scope look on a scope. Yeah, right. Find out where, what your edges look like. Yep. If you've got big rounded edges, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you I did not put a scope on it. I tried to flash it because I didn't know how to flash it. So. Okay. You know that. Uh, How's RS-232 going into the, is the 5-volt system or a 3.3? 3.3, yeah. Are you Typical. using like a 4049 or something to condition it, buffer it before it goes to a low? Because RS-232 is plus and minus Five. potentially, right? Yeah. No, there's, pro no, there's no, probably no, enough to be RS-232 TTL. Right. So you've already got that up in, yeah. So yeah it's TTL like, or 3.3? 3. Well, it's 3.3. 3.3, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the USB chips runs off at 3.3. Yeah, I, I would really look closely. You're using an FT, FTDI chip? No, it's a silicon um, labs. Yeah, it's, look I'm real closely at that chip. That, um, that they, that's on the dev board. Yeah. I, I copied the circuit from the dev board, so it's identical. I didn't want to change that. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be doing tomorrow. Yeah. I, I, I have sympathy for you. All right. Um, and should we end the broadcast? No. Oh. Before we end the broadcast. Oh. Well, I'll wait. I'll just make sure that we're going to do something without making too much noise. For our members in attendance and for the uh, viewers, anyone with uh, something to share, even if it is a, a, a very brief announcement or contribution or prospective project, speech impediment from Trader Joe's, please contact Kevin Appert for fourth day. Forther, F-O-R-T-H-E-R, at Comcast.net. No contribution too great or small, uh, please. Uh, my thanks for your consideration, for your attendance, and for your uh, <laughs> patience with us. Good afternoon. Let us end the show. Yep. Who? Could you make some waves so I can see it in the screen? Very, Very well. I, I'm waiting for the screen. All right. I will watch for that and know that I can sure. end the screen at that moment. Oh, I, I think I see that. That's, that's good. I'll, I'll hopefully catch it. Then. I start seeing you swirling. <laughs>